Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Richard Pan. He is a pediatrician and a California state senator. Dr. Pan, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So um, as I always do with my guests, we uh, dive in just a little bit to understand your background. If you wouldn't mind sharing um, how you got to this point, and in particular for me personally, how on earth you ended up in politics, uh, having obviously had a, an illustrious career as a pediatrician. Well, certainly that was not the original career plan. Uh, I actually went to uh, college, planning to go into medicine, focusing on biomedical research. I was, in fact, a biophysics major in college, and then went into medicine. In the process of my medical training, I actually became much more interested in community health and social determinants of health. And in fact, uh, worked uh, to get my master's in public health and uh, explore these particular issues. And when I came to UC Davis to be a faculty member, I started a training program to educate residents about community health. So that was what I was trying to basically teach and do uh, uh, research and educate people about this issue. In the process of doing that, became much more involved in a variety of community uh, activities, including a starting a nonprofit to get children health care coverage and building a coalition to strengthen our safety net. And in the process of doing that, of course, got much more involved in a variety of different organizations. And then when the Great Recession hit uh, back in 2008, 2009, uh, California had challenges trying to pass its state budget, which had tremendous impacts on children and the community. Uh, and so forth. So in that point in time, living in Sacramento, which was the state capital, I've been involved in helping go testify on bills and at committees and so forth, and uh, was very frustrated about what was happening over at the, at the state capital and how it was impacting my patients and the community. So people said, well, um, you should think about running for the state legislature. And I finally thought to myself, if I'm not willing to throw my hat in a ring and run, how can I complain about what's going on? Now, of course, a few little problems in the way. So first of all, I had never held elected office before. Uh, I was certainly not someone who is uh, that well known in the more political circles. Certainly was not the uh, preferred candidate for uh, even my own party in terms of the uh, usual leap players in the party. But uh, we worked hard, built a strong coalition, and in fact, uh, in 2010, uh, won a, uh, the, my race for the state assembly. It was When I started, most people said, would tell me, well, I like you, but you have no chance of winning, so <laughs> we can't do it. But, you know, we pulled it off, and that's how I ended up in the state legislature. So I, I, I have to ask just briefly, did you, uh, you literally started from zero with nothing, uh, and those, uh, uh, and did you win your first instance of, of going and competing in that space? Yes, I did. Wow. Yeah, so I, I had not been involved in like local party politics or anything like that. And then had decided to run approximately uh, about a year and a half from the election and uh, started from scratch. Uh, now, I did have uh, se- you know, several supporters from my community work. Appreciate the strong support I got from the medical community as well. I had held leadership positions in like the American County Pediatrics. I was the vice chair for the state and I was a leader in the California Medical Association as well. So I did have leadership positions in medicine. I was involved on right. several community organizations back home, but was not in any political uh, position at all. I did serve on a county commission before I had actually uh, finished that service there. Uh, but never held elected office. Well, I, I just want to congratulate you. That just goes to show that, you know, that's even possible. I wouldn't have even imagined that was possible just based on limited experience. So congratulations. Well, thank you. I'm very glad you're there because obviously science-driven 
policy is extraordinarily valuable to us. So um, uh, if we can, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the areas of your focus, your interest. And I know right now um, it's COVID-19 challenges and specifically the issue of getting back to school and doing so safely. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts around that and, and what's going on in, in uh, your, your policy activities. Certainly, uh, we want kids to be able to go back to school safely. Uh, it's very important we get our children educated. One of the things I did prior to going into the legislature, I actually served as the medical consultant for school district in Sacramento. Uh, so I've been very involved working with school nurses and other school personnel as well. And we know that distance learning doesn't work for many families, right? They have right. trouble with broadband. The parents have to go to work. They may be essential workers. Even if they work at home, uh, if they're working at home, they, they're they spending their time working. They're not able to help their children as much as they would like to. And distance learning is, uh, is challenging. In fact, uh, the most successful models involve the parents helping the teachers teach. So we want our kids to go back to school. But we also know that when kids go back to school, people have to feel that they're safe at school, right? Uh, parents have to feel they're safe at school. The teachers and the staff have to feel like they're safe as well. And uh, as long as the COVID virus is out in the community and it's not well under control, it's very hard for us to send kids to school and have them stay there and not have the school potentially close down as soon as a case shows up. And I think that's going to be a big challenge because that's certainly going to be very disruptive to open the school two weeks later, close the school for two weeks, reopen the school as well. And so if we don't have control over this virus out in the community, it's very hard to convince parents and teachers and staff that the school is safe. And so I think that is really the very first step we need to take is to get control over the virus in the general community. We see this in other countries as well, which who have reopened their schools, right? right? That's what we need to do. Uh, So I know people want to focus on, hey, can we send our kids to school now? But if we look around and you go, well, so do you feel like you could, that the virus is under control in the community? Most people would answer, no, it's not right now. And so that makes it very difficult to send kids to school and have them be able to stay at school and keep the schools open. How do we do that? I mean, I I agree with you. We can see it. And, you know, there are certainly good examples, I think, uh, internationally and, you know, in in specific communities where they've managed to do that. We've failed. I know there's a a multitude of reasons that we have. How do we achieve that here in the United States? How do we get to this point? Because you're right, this virtual teaching just doesn't meet the needs for so many kids. And I also mentioned that uh, when kids can't go to school, in addition to the challenges for the students, it's a challenge for their parents or guardians, which means it's difficult for them to be returning to the workforce, uh, at least not being distracted and doing so. So this has a huge impact, both immediate on our economy and, of course, long term when our school students aren't getting their education. So in terms of trying to control it in the community, Those are the basic public health measures. So first of all, we need to come together as a country and do the things we need to do to control this virus, which is right now the evidence shows wearing masks reduces transmission, right? Avoiding large gatherings, particularly indoors. Uh, So don't have that party at home with your relatives because it's someone's birthday or don't go in a big gathering uh, with your friends, uh, out to the beach or the bar. Actually, outside's better than indoors. Uh, so uh, wear, your, wear a mask at all times. We shouldn't have turned masks into a political statement, right? You got to reduce that transmission. And then when we re- are able to show we got the cases going downward, right, then we need to invest and be sure our public health measures are there. So having enough testing so we can test people who may be at risk or are positive, be able to turn those, t- those test results over in f- within 24 to 48 hours, right? So we need to have invested in the supply chain for the test. Right now we have a shortage in tests or long turnaround times because we're running out of test supplies. We need to organize that, right? We need to be sure we have the supply chain ready for the masks and the other protective equipment for people, right? So that's national leadership. By the way, when we reopen schools, 
they're probably going to need to ask people to wear masks. To continue the, the whole process of, you know, that protection right. and ongoing. And, you know, culturally <laughs> that seems to be more accepted in other countries because they've dealt with, you know, previous outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're challenged with that. So do you have a sense of what the, the deciding point is where you, you think that we, we tip over into safety? Is, is there some guidance around that? How, how do we approach that? So I, I would say that the tipping point is when we can basically feel fairly comfortable that we're able to identify the vast majority of people who are carrying the virus, recognizing that many people carrying the virus may be asymptomatic. Right. But when we get the case numbers down, so we need to have them heading downward, not upward, as it's doing right now. When the case numbers are heading downward, then eventually we'll get to a point where the number of cases is small enough, we can then actually reliably test people who may be exposed so you identify, when you identify someone as positive, you do the contact tracing. You're able to not only do the contact tracing and identify who's been in contact, you're now able to test all of those people. You're able to isolate people who are positive. And then because you have a robust testing, contact tracing, and isolation program in place, then you feel that everyone who may be positive is, has been identified. And those people are now... Uh, have a place to be where they are uh, isolated from the rest of the community so that we're not having community transmission. So you think about what happened in New Zealand, where they literally got their cases down almost to zero. And uh, there were some travelers coming from outside. So, you, you know, some people always pop up. But in general, you feel pretty comfortable that, you know what, the odds of that are pretty low. Now, I think people still need to wear masks because there's always a very slight chain, uh, risk of transmission but we know the numbers in the community are very small, right? So our odds of being exposed, of course, depend on how many people in the community might have the virus, as well as, of course, the other, wearing a mask and these other steps. But we feel comfortable that, you know what, there aren't many people out in the community who have the virus, and the ones who do, most of them we've identified and have them isolated until they've recovered. Then we feel safe that we're not going to have uh, people who are near us who might get us infected. So when a teacher sits in the classroom and sees the students sitting there, they're not wondering, wow, maybe one of those students might actually have that virus and might infect the other students or infect me, right? right. The staff in the uh, school who is doing the cleanup isn't thinking that, I wonder who in the school probably actually has the virus and we just don't know about it, right? Mm -hmm. That, so, and the parents, when they send their kids to school, can say that it's very unlikely anyone in the school actually has the virus. And if they did, someone's going to find out pretty soon. And that person is then going to not be at the school until they're better and not able to infect my child. That's where we have to get to. Right. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Richard Pan. He is a pediatrician and also a California state senator. We were talking about getting back to school, uh, the challenges of, uh, you know, the public health requirements, um, how we get that sort of reopening and uh, the elements of uh, what's required. That obviously moves to another area that I know you're uh, very passionate about, as am I, um, around vaccinations. And I think almost Gen well, let's call it generally. I, I don't want to say universally. It seems impossible to say universal in the current environment we're in. Gosh, if we had a COVID-19 vaccine and it was available and we satisfy all of those requirements, great, we'd be back to normal. That's probably not true because there's a large proportion of the society that says they wouldn't take that vaccine. Tell us a little bit about your experience around this, especially as a pediatrician and from a population health standpoint? Well, first of all, uh, science shows that vaccines are safe and effective, and they're effective in two ways. So one way is the person receiving the vaccine is protected against the disease that the vaccine works against. So that's direct protection. But also, the vaccine protects other people in the community if we have a sufficient percentage of people with the vaccine. So something we call uh, herd immunity, or I like to call it community immunity. So 
because there's always a certain percentage of people in our community who cannot receive the vaccine. So let's talk about the measles vaccine. Infants who are too young, under a year of age, or in an outbreak under six months of age, can't get that vaccine. There are people who may be treated for cancer or have a transplant or have some other immune condition who do not respond uh, well to the vaccine, so the vaccine is not particularly effective for them. But if the rest of us get vaccinated, then they are also protected. And so both mechanisms are really important to keep our community safe. So the concern is, is that when we have people who refuse to get the vaccine, not because they're unable to get it, not because they're truly at risk for getting the vaccine, but because of disinformation, uh, because of anxiety and fear that's driven by a lack of trust that they are receiving misinformation, or even people intentionally spreading uh, false information about the vaccine, then that becomes a concern because if the overall vaccination rate's too low, then the disease will still spread. Certainly the people who receive the vaccine still have some protection, but uh, the disease will continue to spread. So when you talk about COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine yet for that disease. We hope to get one. It will still take a while to get there. But when we do have it, we need to be sure we have a sufficiently high percentage of people in the community who have it to protect the overall community. Because it's possible, and again, we don't have the vaccine, so we don't know who would most benefit from it and who might not benefit from it. So the people who are unable to get it or for whom it may not be as effective, they need the protection of the rest of us who are able to get the vaccine where it is very effective to help protect everyone in the community. Yeah, so I, just for clarity, let's uh, let, let's state from my perspective, I'm in violent agreement with you. Um, I, I think everybody that listens to my show knows that's the case. But for a second, if we could, tell me your I, I, I don't I, I, I'm not even sure how to phrase the question. Your understanding of this anti-science position that is essentially pushing back on really well-established research protocols that are protected. As I started out medicine, and for the life of me, I never thought I would see some of the diseases that I'm seeing now in our society. What is going on, and how do we deal with it? Well, unfortunately, uh, there are a small group of people who drive the this source of disinformation, uh, they often um, may be financially incentivized. So it's part of their business model for, let's say, selling uh, certain things that they're interested in selling, usually alternative medicine. Uh, Now, I want to be clear that not all people who sell alternative medicine are necessarily anti-vaccine, but unfortunately, there are people who, it's their business model, Uh, create fear and anxiety about vaccines as a way to drive sales for whether it's their books, lectures, movies, uh, products that they want to sell that they claim are a, quote, safer or more natural alternative to vaccines. I'll point out that actually vaccines are a way of stimulating your natural immune system to protect you. So there's few things more natural than actually a vaccine. (laughs) But, you know, they'll go around and say vaccines are you know, a pharmaceutical product and uh, my processed supplements is actually more natural than, uh, than that. So, which um, I tell people eat a healthy balanced diet is perhaps more natural than taking any supplements. Uh, but unfortunately, that group of people uh, does have a motivation to spread this disinformation. I think uh, in terms of people choosing not to vaccinate, the majority of them are people who are you know, anxious and fearful uh, and of vaccines and because they've been hearing this thing. But if there's an opportunity to, to educate them, perhaps we can change their mind. But the other challenge that we've also learned as we looked at vaccine hesitancy is, is that if someone is exposed to these ideas or disinformation before they are exposed to information about vaccines, it actually can be very difficult and takes a lot of effort to uh, educate people. So one of the challenges we also have is that, unfortunately, uh, social media has become a mechanism by which uh, the people who are interested in spreading vaccine disinformation are given a megaphone to do so, right? And so Facebook allows closed Facebook groups, which allows uh, people to 
get indoctrinated if they're drawn into those groups. So the people running those groups ensure that scientific information isn't allowed within. If someone tries to post something there, they're banned and those posts are deleted. And so people are drawn in to these groups and then they're indoctrinated about anti-vaccine uh, mythology, which then becomes very hard to to get them to change their mind, right? Uh, of course, the, uh, the people who are selling these products are investing in marketing as well. Uh, so uh, that becomes a challenge. And so people have done studies looking at this particular issue. I think part of it is, is that, of course, we need to educate people about science and vaccines uh, early on. Uh, one should argue that before a parent sees a pediatrician for their child, they should have already learned about vaccines. Uh, even uh, when the mother was pregnant or even earlier, we should be talking about the immune system and vaccines and how they work, uh, perhaps in high school and in college. So people understand this because it's too easy when you go online to run into vaccine uh, misinformation. And in fact, studies have shown that a vast number of parents actually are exposed to this this information. So um, we've got a little bit of time left, which is frustrating because I'd love to dive in deep, especially with, you know, both the political, the opportunity to, you know, influence policy and so forth. But I, I interviewed and uh, that this show will be coming up Kathleen Carley. She's a <clears throat> Carnegie Mellon uh, researcher focused on social media and one of the stats that she had was 40% of the material that's on Twitter and some of these other channels is bots. Bots designed to create disinformation. So I agree with you all of those categories, but there seems to be a, a, an additional component of bad actors. Do you think they're as significant in this space as they are in others, or is that less of an issue in terms of dealing with this? It is significant in this space, uh, the bots help magnify this kind of disinformation. So the challenge with social media is that it gives a megaphone to vaccine disinformation. You know, anti-vaxxers have been around for a long time since Jenner invented the uh, first vaccine against smallpox. That's so true. they've been around. But yep. I think what we've seen more recently uh, in the past couple of decades is that they've gotten more traction with both the internet when uh, they've learned to manipulate the search engines. And then now, especially with social media, which is giving them a platform for doing that. There are even uh, actors who don't wish us well, uh, who have also tried to uh, uh, support the anti-vaccine movement uh, as a way to divide our country. So we know that uh, the Russian uh, Internet bots uh, who also uh, uh, were involved in other efforts to divide our country around race and other issues have also uh, dived into the uh, this vaccine space as a way to, again, create division and also uh, perhaps uh, get us sick, that uh, anything to weaken our country. And so we need to take some steps to address the issue of uh, spread of health disinformation, which actually leads to real harm. Fantastic. So great discussion. I, I, I just, you know, I applaud you for stepping into the political arena because that's a, that's a, a challenging space, more so than medicine, let's be clear, at least I think so, and I've not been in there. You know, applaud the sort of approach to opening of schools and the vaccination. Any parting thoughts in the last uh, few seconds, things that we should be thinking about? Well, it's very important that... Uh, People work together to uh, support good science. Uh, we can't take that for granted. Uh, it's very important we work together to be sure people have access to accurate health information. It's also, by the way, also important that um, we take steps to limit the uh, amount of hate uh, that we see as well on social media and the Internet. Because one of the challenges that we've run into around not only the vaccine space, but others around science and public health is that not only is there disinformation being spread, that unfortunately some of these people who support this disinformation also engage in attacks and threats to silence people, physicians, scientists, who are trying to propose uh, measures to support public health. So we have to be sure they're protected as well. Fantastic. So uh, in the uh, show notes and the accompanying blog post, I'll put in something about Shots Heard, who do a fantastic job of helping and supporting that space. Uh, I, it just remains for me to thank you, uh, Dr. Richard Pan, pediatrician and California State Center, for uh, joining me today. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. It's a true pleasure to be talking to you. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. Evolution.